Hi, this is Jeff Challen. So in today's video lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of arrays and begin talking about algorithms. So obviously we're not in full intro together, which I'm sad about, um, but the sides are in the usual place online. Um, you don't have to follow along. There's no participation points for today's lecture, but I hope that as we go, and as we work on some of the examples, you'll pause, work on them, and then continue the video. Uh, the video may be a little shorter because I may go through some of the things more quickly than I would in class because I'm not gonna stop and give you time to work on the examples. So I'll indicate when I'm about to solve a problem, you can pause the video, uh, try it yourself on the slides, and then look at how we solve it. Okay, so today's discussion um, is about computer algorithms and uh, arrays. So we're going to continue our discussion of arrays. We'll talk about array indexing. And then we're going to begin what is going to be a long conversation that's going to span multiple lectures and on some level the rest of the semester about computer algorithms, the conceptual heart of computer science, how we use computers to solve problems. And one of the things that some of you have noticed as you begin to work on MP0 is that even given a problem like LCM that's very well defined, there are still many different ways that you can solve it using a computer, many different approaches. Um, some of them have you know, certain trade-offs, and that's another thing that we'll spend a lot of time talking about in this class, and we'll teach you how to analyze algorithms, how to look at their properties, how long do they take to run, how much memory do they consume, and things like this. Um, what makes one algorithm better than another? Okay, but let's review arrays before we move forward. So. We started talking about arrays last time, and arrays were our first example of a data structure that we're going to talk about in this class, and they won't be the last, so we'll talk about several other types of data structure. But an array brings structure to a set of values by putting them in order. So we talked about how data structures associate metadata with data. So the data inside the array is the series of values. But the metadata is an index or an order. So I've taken a bunch of values, and in Java they have to be the same type, that could have just been all jumbled together, and I've put them one after another. And when we talk about DNA, when we talk about audio data, when we talk about text, that order is really significant. So think about taking a piece of uh, a published piece of writing or a piece of text and just jumbling all the letters around. Uh, you know, what creates structure, what creates meaning out of characters is the order in which they appear in a document. So losing that order, uh, you essentially lose all of the information that was in that, that piece of data. So when we talk about an array, not only can we talk about the data inside of it, but each data value has an index. That index is a position in the array. Um, just like other variables in Java, arrays have a name and a type. Um, the de declaration syntax is a little bit different. So you'll notice here, when I declare a single integer, I have the type and I have a name. So this is a single value of type int called integer. When I declare an array, I use this array declaration syntax. So this is two brackets, and this says I'm declaring an array of type int. It's going to store integers called multiple. So here's a declaration of a single character called one, and here's the declaration of an array, the brackets, of characters called all. One thing that sometimes trips up people that haven't done this before is that the indices for an array are always integers, regardless of what's in the array. So the metadata about the values in the array are always integers. So even if I have a character array, for example, the position of each element within the array is always an integer. And that's how, that we're gonna see in a minute, that's how we dereference, or that's how we uh, access each element inside the array. When we declare an array in Java, it's initially empty, and that's not particularly useful. Uh, to use it, we actually have to tell Java how many elements it has. So here's an example. I'm declaring an array of type int, called multiple, and this is new syntax for us. And I just want to pause and point this out. So we're, I'm, in order to declare an array, I have to use this new keyword. And this will become obvious in a few more lectures why we're doing this. But for now, you know, just notice this and make sure that you understand how to use this. Um, so I'm going to create a new array of integers of type int. And over here on the right, I'm telling Java how many values this is going to have. So this is an array that can store eight different integers. 
Arrays in Java have a really useful property. So on some level, arrays in Java are very similar to arrays in lower level languages like C and C++, but they have this really great feature, which is that a Java array knows how long it is. So it has this property, and this is another new piece of syntax that is gonna become very clear to us in a few weeks when we start talking about objects, but arrays have a property that I can access. The property is called length, and I access it using this dot notation. So if I print off, I've created, I've declared and initialized my array of integers called multiple, and I can print the length. This will print eight. I'll show you this in a minute. So down here, here's an array of characters named all, and then just like I did with variables, I can, I can either do the declaration and the initialization all in one line, or I can break them into two parts. Here I've declared to Java, I want to have a variable called all that's going to store an array of characters, and then here I initialize it to hold four values. Okay. You can also assign values to an array when it is initialized. So this is similar to sort of uh, assigning a literal value to a variable when you initialize it. So in this case, I'm creating an array called multiple. It's of type int. So again, it's an array. That's uh, the syntax here makes it an array. It's of type int, name multiple. And this syntax with the braces, which is Java's way of doing this, uh, says that multiple is gonna store four values. The first value in the array, at index zero is gonna be one. The second value in the array, index one is gonna be two. The third value in the array, index two is gonna be five. And the fourth value in the array, index three is going to be 10. You're gonna do the same thing with characters. So this is, this is pretty similar. You'll notice here that I don't have to tell Java in this case how big the array is because it can figure it out. So it says, okay, these are the values you wanna put in. This is an array of, that is gonna store four values. One thing that trips people up, it's this common source of mistakes when we begin working with arrays, is this notion of what's called zero indexing. So, you know, a lot of us were taught to count starting at one. One, two, three, four, five. Um, zero is a number. And in computer science, zero is always the first element of an array. So the element at index zero is the first element. The element at index one is the second element. Once you get used to this, it's completely second nature but this will trip some of you up as you get started. So the first element in array is at index zero. The second element is at index one. That means that the last element in the array is at index, the length of the array minus one. So that's another common mistake. And we'll, we'll have some chance to practice this in a minute. Okay, I just said all these things. Great, okay, so let's mess around a little bit with uh, arrays, okay? So on line one, I'm declaring an array called twos that stores three values. One is at index zero, two is at index one, four is at index two. This is an array of type int. And I'm, gonna sh I'm starting to show you the syntax for accessing members of the array. So I, this is called bracket syntax. So this is gonna print off the element of twos at index zero. So that's the first element in the array. I can do the same thing. I can set the element, the elements inside the array using the same syntax. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna change the first value of twos, the value at index zero, the first value of twos to two. Then I'm gonna print that off. So this, is, this should print one. I've changed it here to two, so this should now print two. This is printing the last element, the third element at index two, that's gonna print four. And then here's, this should also print the last element. So let's think about what's gonna happen here. Twos.length is the length of the array twos. The length is three. So this is gonna to evaluate to three. Three minus one is gonna to evaluate to two. Twos two is the last element in the array. I guess I could have chosen a better name for the array here. All right, so let's run this guy and see what happens. Right, so this is pretty much what we predicted. This is the printf, the, the, the first println. Uh, which is right here, that prints the first value, then I change it to two, now I'm gonna print the first value again, but now that first value is two, and then I print the last value twice. Okay. I'm, so one of the things you have to be very careful about in Java is 
making sure that you don't walk off the end of an array. And this is an error that I am 100% positive that we will start to see on the forum and you will start to see in your code. So if you try to access an element that is not valid inside the array, you're gonna get something like this. So this is runtime error null. Why did this happen? Well, this is the zeroth element of the array at index zero. This is the element in index one. This is the element in index two. This is the element in index three. There is no element in index four. I would get the same error if I tried to do this. There's also no element in index in negative one or 100. Uh, that's way off the end of the array. So a lot of times when we start working with arrays at first, it's common to have problems where you, it's frequently, uh, frequently we're gonna use a loop to process the elements of, the, of an array. And it's common to write your loop slightly wrong and have it kind of look at one too many elements, right? So it gets to the end and it goes one too far and you see a, a problem like this. Okay. The, you know, arrays in Java do have this nice feature, but they also have a limitation that's common to arrays in languages like C and C++. They are fixed size, meaning that once I initialize the array, I can't change the number of items that it has. I can change items in the array. We just saw how to do that, but I can't make the array bigger or smaller. I can reinitialize the array to be a different size, but then I'm losing the original elements. So I can't say, okay, I wanted to store seven elements, but I only have an array of size five, so how do I add things to the end? If you use, if you've learned languages like Python, this is a very natural operation, and we will talk later in the class about a slightly more advanced data structure in Java that does allow us to do these types of things. But for right now, we're talking about the simplest, most basic Java array. And that array does not allow us to change the size. This can complicate our programs because, you know, we need to think a little bit up front when we use this more basic type of Java array about how big it needs to be. Um, this also explains something about the world that you might have been curious about. So I want to sort of pause here for a brief digression. So the vast majority of students in this class, I wish I could show you my class roster, but I can't, um, have net IDs ending in two. And I suspect that when I'm still teaching this class in 2030, many of people will have net IDs ending in three or ending in four. So why is this? The reason is a long time ago, somebody designed a computer system that eventually became very popular. And that computer system had a limitation, which is that user accounts, your username, what we call your net ID here, but you know, on other systems, people call their username is limited to eight characters. So somewhere on some computer system on campus, there's an array of size eight that stores your net ID. And so, you know, if your name is, you know, Jane Doe the third, we can't give you Jane Doe the third because that's more than eight characters. So once we have Jane Doe and we have Jane Doe the second, we give Jane Doe the second, Jane Doe two, Jane Doe three. Some of you um, that have more common last names may have extremely large numbers back there or the university has done really bizarre things like mix in parts of your middle name or like chop off your last name halfway through. Um, this is the reason why. This is, and you know, I'm sorry that this sort of silly limitation of a computer system that somebody designed many, many decades ago is still having an impact on your life, but it is. And so this is why, this is why your net IDs have this very compressed format. You'll also notice that none of them are longer than eight characters. And that's the reason. All right. So like I said, there are other array-like data structures in Java that are more flexible and have more features. And we'll talk about those later, but it's important to understand how to use these simple arrays because they actually are extremely useful. So we're talking about arrays right after we talk about loops, partly because arrays are the simplest data structure in Java, but also because arrays and loops are best buds. So frequently what we're doing when we use a loop is that we're using a loop to process an array. We're using the loop to examine every element in an array and then do something with it. Um, you know, make a modification to it, include it in some sort of computation, whatever. Um, 
So this is probably the, one of the most common for loops in all of computer code. It is, it iterates over an array. That's how you describe what this for loop does. It starts at index zero. It goes until i is less than the length of the array. And this is critical. We'll talk about why in a second. And it increments i at each step. So I start with the first index, the zeroth index of the array, the first element in the array. And I go one at a time. And I look at the first, then the second, then the third, or I look at the one at index zero, and then one at index one, and then one at index two. And I do that until I get to the end of the array. Remember that the last element in the array is not at the index length. It's at the index length minus one. So that's why this less than ensures that we don't walk off the end of the array. So for this example, I've got zero, one, two, three, four, five. Those are the indices of the array. So the last valid index in the array is five. The length of the array is six. It has six elements. So the first time through the loop, I'm going to do the first element, which is an index zero. The second time I'm going to do the second element, which is an index one. And the last time is going to be when i is five. Primes that length is six. Five is less than six. Five is the sixth element of, index five is the sixth element of primes. That's the last one. So again, this for loop, I suspect if you did an analysis of all the computer code in the world, you know, for loops are more common than while loops. This for loop is probably the most common for loop on earth. Nothing, you know, there's just nothing that's more uh, canonical when we write computer code than iterating through an array. So in Java, there's also something new, the enhanced, and I, I find this to be sort of funny because this is a, a form of a loop that many other languages have had for a long time, but you'll see this syntax as well. So I just want to show you this. This is uh, that, that, operation of going through every element in the array is so common that Java has a shortcut for it. So here's what I'm doing up here. You'll see that I'm taking an array of primes as six elements and I'm going through every value. Fre I'm going through every value in the array, but frequently we don't want the index. We want the thing that's in the array at that value, right? So here, what you'll do is you'll see I'm printing off at every step the element, the, the value that's inside primes at that index. So if I ran this, it would print 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. Down here, I have the same for loop written using this what's called enhanced for loop syntax. So I declare an int called prime, and then I use this colon. And what happens is prime is going to receive every value that's stored inside primes. So the nice thing is I don't have to worry about the indexing. Um, so if this runs, it's actually going to do the exactly same thing as the code at the top. Um, the only drawback here is I don't have access to the index. So you'll see that as I'm running, I don't actually know what the index is at that, uh, of that particular value. Um, and there are times when we don't care. And so this can be a useful loop to, to know about. Okay. So now we've come to the point where let's do some practice. So here's an example. I've got a, um, a character array, uh, called to print. It's got four values. And I'm going to want to print. I just want to print every member. Um, and so this might be a point to, to pause. Uh, but let's talk about a little bit first about how we're going to do this. So I need a loop. Um, and I want to see every element of to print. So I could use an enhanced for loop that I just looked at. Or I could use just that really common for loop syntax. Um, so if you want to pause and give this a try, now's the time to do it. OK, so let's do this. So I'm going to write my for loop. I'll do this two different ways. I'm going to do it with the index. And then I'll also do it um, using the enhanced for loop syntax. You can see both. So in this case, what I'm doing, I've got that canonical for loop. I can almost write this one in my sleep. I declare an indexing variable called i. I started at 0, which is the first element of the array. I run it up until it's. Um, I continue the, the loop while it's less than to print.length, so this will stop as soon as it equals to print.length, and I increment it on every iteration. Inside the loop, I'm going to use that to access the value of to print at the ith index. And so this will print a, b, c, d. Great. So let me show you how to do that using the enhanced for loop syntax. So in this uh, uh, example, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm actually not allocating 
an, uh, a, um, my, my for loop is not allocating uh, or, or declaring an integer variable, it's declaring a variable of type care because that's what's inside the array. So this says, give me every element of to print in a variable called value of type care because again, that's the type of the array and then I'll print it off here. And so again, this does the exactly same thing. So two different ways to, to solve that problem. All right, so let's let's do a slightly different version of this problem. Um, we've been you've you've seen us use system .println a lot, and what println does is it prints the um, whatever the arguments are, and then it prints a new line. So that's why each one of these letters appears on a separate line. If I want to print them on the same line, and this just gives me practice at writing that canonical loop. I can do system.out.print, and that will not print a new line. And so what this will do is print everything on one line. So only difference here, println, I get a new line after every call, print, I don't. Okay, and again, I could write this using the enhanced for loop syntax. I could say care value, give me every value from to print, and then I print the value inside the array. Boom, good. All right, so now let's do a slightly more complicated example. So now I wanna print every member of to print backwards, and you could either do this on one line or on multiple lines. So again, if you're following along at home, this might be a good time to pause the video, uh, give yourself a minute to, to try this problem, and then join up with me in a second. I'll show you how to do it. Okay, let's, uh, let's try this. So. Now, this is, this is a less common loop. You do see it sometimes, but it's something that you, you, you should know how to do. Okay, so I know I need a for loop. Now, I also, um, I'm gonna start at which value? So when I go through the loop forward, I start at zero, because that's the first value, but what's the last value in the array? Well, the last value in the array is actually to print dot length minus one. That's the last index, sorry, of the array is to print at length minus one. So in this case, that would be three, okay? My update condition is also kind of easy. I'm going down. So I'm going from three to two to one to zero. So I know that I wanna decrement i at every step. The last thing that's a little tricky here is the, um, the check. How do I know when I'm done? And it turns out that I wanna continue this as long as i is greater than or equal to zero because I do want to use index zero, it's the index of the first element. So now again, inside my loop, I'll just print. I'll print it out a new one. All right, bingo, okay. This is a little bit of a trickier one to get right, right? And so, you know, co common mistakes. So I've, if I started at index four, then I'm gonna have this out of bounds exception that I looked at before because four is not a valid index for this array. The valid indices are zero, one, two, and three. Um, okay, sometimes I get this right and then I write something like this and this will run, but you'll see, uh-oh, what happened to A? Well, what happened is that I started at three, I ran it with three, I ran it with two, I ran it with one, I got to zero and the check said is i greater than zero? No, zero is not greater than itself and it stopped. So this is, um, this is something else to be aware of when you're trying to go backwards. So let me actually just write these side by side so you can see them together. This is the forward loop and this is its reverse incarnation. Put a little, put a little barrier here just so we can see where the first one stops and the second one starts. Right. So yep, forward, backward, forward start at zero, go up to uh, continue while it's less than two print dot length increment. Backwards start at two print dot length minus one, continue while it's greater than or equal to zero, and decrement. So. By far the most common loop you're gonna see is the forward loop. There are times when for whatever reason you wanna go backwards through an array and here's how to do it. Okay. Oh, okay, so this is a fun one. Now let's only print the values with even indices. So 
this is, you know, maybe, you know, germane to one of our homework problems, but let's give it a shot. So again, if you want to pause now, um, think about how to do this, give it a shot, and then we'll do it together. Okay, so let's tackle this guy. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna start by just doing my standard um, array. So, and now what I now what I want to do inside the array is I want to test to see if i is even is i an even indice. So if and you know you can do some it's totally uh, okay and this is um, you know something that that I do to just build up your solution in parts. So okay so now I'm printing every element that's not what I want I only want the ones with even indices. So how do I test if the indice is even? Well, remember in Java, I have something called a remainder operator, and that remainder operator tells me what the remainder is if I divide a certain value by another value. So this is the remainder operator in Java. It's not something we've seen in class before, um, but what it does is it says, again, here's the remainder if I divided this integer by this other integer. So this is integer division. The remainder is, you know, what's left over. And so if a value is even, then the remainder when I divide by two is zero. And so this will only print the even indices. And to convince ourselves of that, let's put in, well, I'll put it in here. We'll say uh, I plus, right? So you can, now I'm printing the index with the space and then the value of the array. I see the first time through zero, I've got an A, second time through two, well, sorry, the, the third time, first time through, third time through, fifth time through. The other times I'm not entering this if statement. So I can put that down here if we want to see what the indexes are that were being skipped. All right, so index is even, I print the value, index is odd. Index is even, I print the value, index is odd. Index is even, I print the value, index is odd. I could do this differently. So let's let's uh, let's go come up with a little bit of a more clever solution. Um, by the way, this type of exploration, this type of just fiddling around with things, putting in print statements, is really useful when you're getting started learning how to program. It it gives you an insight into what the computer is doing. Um, so you know we at some point this semester we'll show you how to use a debugger, which is a much more powerful tool that will provide a lot of information about what's going on inside the computer as your code runs. But these types of print statements are super useful. You know I don't fire up a full debugger very often, if ever. Uh, most of the way that I solve problems with my code is through observation. It's by putting in print statements, um, also by ensuring that certain things are correct at various points, which is something else that we'll talk about later in the semester. Okay, so this is one way to solve this problem, and it works. And so we can be happy with it. But there, you know, some of you might be thinking, well, I, I could do this in a different way. And that is true. So let's try a different solution. Again, this is, on some level, we're talking about baby algorithms now. And so frequently, there's more than one way to solve a problem. So rather than going through every index and only printing if the index is even, I can adjust my loop so that the loop only considers even indices. So instead of adding one every time, I can change the loop so it adds two. So now I'm never even going to enter the loop with an odd indice. I'm gonna start with zero and then I'm gonna have two and I'm gonna have four. And this should work regardless of whether the array length is even or odd, but we'll test both. Okay, there we go. So again, same thing I did before, a little simpler um, in the sense there's no if statement inside the loop. Uh, the loop is a little more complicated, so there's a trade-off there. If you write the canonical loop and put the if statement inside, somebody reading it may see more clearly what the loop is doing. But in this case, what I've done is I've made my loop a little bit more efficient, so it's not considering the odd indices at all, um, and the statement inside of it is simpler. So whenever you're doing stuff like, like this, it's always good to try a couple of examples to make sure that things are working the way you thought. So it worked when I had an even number of values in the array, and I also wanna make sure it works when I have an odd number of values in the array, and it looks like it does. So when I have an odd number of values, this is the first element, the third, the fifth, and the seventh. So now 2Print has seven elements. The last element in 2Print is at index six. That indice is even, it's being printed. Okay, great. 
Another fun question. And again, relevant to some of the, the things that we've been doing. And, and, and there is a missing semicolon here. I'll try to fix that before I post this. So what we've been doing so far is essentially just going through an array and looking at each element. But a lot of times what we want to do is we actually want to process things. And that means having some way to store information that's outside of the loop. And this is a very, very common idiom and something that you will become very familiar with by the time you're done with this class. But what I, and, and the pattern for this goes as follows. I initialize some variable that's gonna store some data outside the loop. Then I write a loop that goes through every element of the array. In that loop, I do something to that variable that I left outside, and when I'm done, I have an answer. So again, if you're following along at home, this is a good time to pause before uh, we go on. Think about how you might uh, uh, solve this problem, and then we'll do it together. Okay, a small awkward pause later. Let's think about this. So I know I need a loop to get to every element of the array, and I can start by writing that loop. And why don't I write that loop using the enhanced for loop syntax just for fun? So this is simple. This gives me every value in the, in the, the array. But now it's like, what do I do inside? I'm not printing them. I actually want to compute the sum. Okay, well, if I do something like this, what's gonna happen? Well, I'm declaring sum inside the loop. Um, and so I could do something like sum is equal to zero, sum plus equal value. Um, but the problem here is now my variable sum, there's two problems. First of all, I can't use it outside the loop. And I'm reinitializing it to zero every time. And so it's not actually going to be accumulating the values inside the loop. It's only going to, you know, so every time I go through the loop, I'll create a new variable called sum. I'll set it to zero. I'll add the value. The next time I come through, I've forgotten what the sum is that I'm supposed to remember. So this is an example of a place where I need to store some information outside the loop. And so I declare something that I'm going to update outside the loop. And then each time through the loop, I'm modifying that value. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I'm looking at the first value, I'm adding it to the sum. Then I look at the second value, add it to the sum. I look to the third value, add it to the sum. And when I'm done, what I should have is the sum of the elements in the array. And sure enough, I do, it's 150. So again, this is a super common programming construct. Uh, you see this all the time, you know, and, and when I do this, I typically, you know, put some white space around things to, you know, um, to make sure that, and, and you can do multiple things. So let's say we wanted to uh, compute both the sum and the product. So I'm going to, so now every time through the loop, I'm adding um, the value to the sum and I'm multiplying the product uh, by the value. And when I'm done, I can print off both. Uh, what did I do wrong? Probably something. Oh, sorry, product. There we go. Yeah, there you go. Um, and so it's it's common to have loops where you're going through every element of the rate. You're actually kind of updating multiple computations at the same time. So this is an example. But certainly you can also do one. Okay, so. Another you know, very common pattern. If you're struggling a little bit right now and if you're a little confused, don't worry. We will, you will have so much practice with these things. One of the reasons that we are just on fast forward now for the first couple of weeks is that we are getting you to the point where you can do this, you can start doing it, you can at least pattern match a little bit, and then we're gonna practice, 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 practice throughout the rest of the semester. And by the time you are done, you will be able to write these things in your sleep. I will put this question on the exam and you will be like, ha ha, this is so easy, I'm done. It takes me 30 seconds, right? Uh, but part of that is just practice. So I have written loops like this probably in my career tens of thousands of times. Um, you never stop needing these types of tools. You're going to, um, you know, Going through every value in the array and you know updating the computation is something that I write code that still does today. It's just so common. You've got to start to learn how to do it. And we will help you learn how to do it by giving you lots of chances to repeat these types of computations. Okay. 
So we're at the point now where we've basically gotten through all of these simple things that computers are good at. We know how to get them to do math. We've seen ways to update variables. We have seen conditional expressions and conditional statements. We have talked about loops and we've talked about variables. So these are the basic building blocks. And these are the basic computer capabilities that are really special, but how do we get them to solve problems? So we're a long way from being able to take these capabilities and for example, get a computer to play chess or get a computer to analyze a song for us or you know whatever. Um, what we'll be talking about for the next rest of the semester essentially are computer algorithms. A computer algorithm is a series of steps performed by a computer that solves a problem. An algorithm is a process of set of rules that solves a problem. You implement algorithms. There are human algorithms. You have ways that you solve problems. And as computer scientists, we implement algorithms by having computers perform simple calculations, store the results, make simple decisions, and repeat things. And communicate with us. You know, tell us the result. Take some input from us. Do some work. Tell us what happened. Computer algorithms. So one of the things I want you to make aware of is that Again, you solve problems. As a human, you have algorithms that you apply to things. You may not have thought about them in that way, but you have approaches to problems. Computers have different capabilities than you do. And that's one of the things that makes them so exciting to learn how to use and how to program. Is that computers have these new capabilities. They can do things that you can't. They're, you know, they're way better at repeating things over and over again, fast, really fast than you are. Um, and so when we implement computer algorithms, frequently we want to do it in a way that you sort of respects and harnesses those capabilities, those special features. So the way that a computer solves a problem is not the same way that a human solves a problem. Remember, computers don't play chess like a human plays chess. Computers don't analyze text the way a computer the way a human analyzes text. Computers, when we when we train computers to do these things, we harness the things that they do well. And that gives us new ways of solving problems that humans wouldn't be able to do. So if you think about how a computer drives a car, for example, they are using their capabilities to do things in ways that humans can't. So humans are fantastic at communication and we have extremely strong visual processing. Computers are harnessing their ability to repeat things over and over again and you know, analyze data and, and observe patterns and things like this. Right? That's, that's what they're using in order to try to mimic some of the same things that we can do. So when a computer and a human solve the same problem, frequently they do it in completely different ways. And learning how to program computers and about computer science is partly about understanding what computers can do well and then learning how to solve problems in ways that are a good fit for those computer capabilities. So I like this graph. So algorithms are not a new idea. In fact, an algorithm is a, is a word that has, I think, um, uh, words in the uh, roots of the Arabic language. Actually, it's a very old word. But but look at the use of algorithm. Right. Um, this is like a fun graph that you can get on Google. Um, and again, we talked about how we're starting to analyze text using computers. So here's an example of the kind of analysis you could do. So this is textual analysis of the frequency of the word algorithm as it appears in various types of publications and in various types of communication. And you can see that, you know, right around 1960, um, algorithm starts to skyrocket, both, both the small case and the uppercase version of this. And what's happening around 1960, 1970? Early computers. Um, and, and this has just taken off since then, right? So this has really part, become part of our, our modern lexicon. So for the next couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about algorithms. We're gonna every day in class as we, and we're gonna introduce some new Java features and we can talk about some new ideas, but you know, we're really gonna root our discussion in algorithms. We're gonna focus on implementing simple algorithms using the Java capabilities that you already know. So this is gonna allow us to do two things. First of all, we're gonna to get to talk about algorithms and we're gonna to start to look at how computers solve problems, but it also is gonna give you a lot of practice in taking those imperative programming building blocks loops, variables, arrays, conditional statements, and conditional expressions, and using them to solve problems.
Uh, that's what MP0 is about. That's what the next few weeks in the class are about. That's what the homework problems are going to be about. Um, and all of that should work together. Okay, so let's do quickly now at the very end of class, um, let's think about how to solve a particular problem using a computer. So I have an array of integers and I want to locate the maximum value. So the first thing we're going to do when we solve problems like this is we're going to figure out what is our algorithm. So we're going to declare a maximum value before we start, but what should we initialize it to? So that's interesting. Um, then I'm going to look at each value in the array. What am I going to do at that point? I'm going to say, is this value bigger than the maximum or not? And then do what? So again, if you're following along at home, this is a good chance to pause, you know, maybe open up a Google Doc or whatever and kind of try to think about how are we going to solve this problem? What is our algorithm going to be? Okay, again, let's, let's pause for a minute. I want to let you take a minute to think about how to solve this problem, set up your solution. This is certainly something that you might see or a variant of this on an MP. In fact, you do see a variant of this on our MP or on a homework problem uh, coming. All right, so let's, let's give this a try. So I need a variable to store my maximum. These are ints, and so that's going to have to be an integer variable. Now, one of the challenges with a problem like this is, what do I initialize my maximum to? Well, if I, let's say I initialize this to zero. What happens if all the values in the array are smaller than zero? Then it's going to be hard to find my maximum. So I'm going to leave this alone for now. I'll come back to it in a sec, but let's write my loop. Um, and I'll use the old Java for loop syntax. All right, so now I'm going through every value in, in my array. This is my very canonical loop, very common loop. And what am I going to do? I'm going to say, if the value at that position is greater than my maximum, then I should, I found a new maximum. So I set the value, my maximum to that new value. And then down here, I'm going to print off the maximum just to make sure that it's correct. All right, so I'm almost done here. Um, and in fact, this with the array, uh, what is going on here? Maybe I need to initialize this guy. Yeah, okay. So now in this case, all of the values were bigger than my maximum. And so I have found the maximum. But let's say that I have, let's try it with some different inputs. Negative one, negative two, negative 10. Okay, so in this case, it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because all the values were smaller than zero. So, you know, I initialized this to zero and then I was looking at the values and they were all smaller than zero. And so that doesn't, this doesn't make a lot of sense. So let's see, see if we can uh, modify this to, to work. And the trick here is to set maximum to a value in the array. So we know that the maximum return should be one of the elements of the array. And this is a common trick, which is that I just use the first element to initialize my maximum. So now the first time through the loop, maximum is going to be negative one. If I change this to negative 10, it'll be negative 10. And now what you'll see is that this is going to work properly because it starts out negative 10. The first time through the loop is sort of wasted because I'm comparing the first element against itself. I'm comparing the element at index zero to the element at index zero, and it's never gonna be bigger than itself. And we can show you how to fix that in a sec, but it's okay. The next time through I have negative one, negative one is bigger than negative 10, so I update maximum to negative one, and then I never see a larger value, and so I'm done. I can, get away with changing this loop slightly to make it a little bit more efficient. So I don't have to re-examine the first value again because I've already set it to the maximum. So I can start my loop at the second item, the item in index one. And this will also work. So whenever we're solving problems like this, it's also really useful to make sure that we have a bunch of different test cases. So let's make sure that this works. Let's make sure it works when the value is the first element of the array. Let's make sure it works when the maximum is the last element in the array. These are the kind of tests that we're going to talk about in a few weeks where we're trying to figure out corner cases. Because, you know, maybe I had, maybe I messed up and my loop was a little bit wrong, right? And so what you'll see here is that 
if my loop is wrong and it's not seeing the last element, then this test case will help me figure that out. So if I test with this array, I'm going to say, uh-oh, the maximum is 21 and I return 20. Why is that? And then as I start to investigate, I'm going to notice, oh, right, you know, this is, this is more for going backwards through an array. Um, you know, I, I want to make sure I see every element. Okay, so again, first of many different examples of trying to figure out how to implement a computer algorithm. The way that we do this is in two steps. We first figure out what our algorithm is. And you can actually write this down in your code. So I could have started by doing this. I should have done it this way. And I can say, examine every element in the array, update the maximum if, if the current element is larger. So I could have started with this. And when you come into office hours, a lot of times we'll ask you to do something like this. Start out by writing a skeleton just in comments. This is your algorithm. Now I start to put some computer code behind this. Okay, I need a variable called maximum. And I'm going to do my loop. And I will use the enhanced for loop syntax here this time. And then this is going to go, this is something I'm doing for each element of the loop. So this really belongs in here. This is, so I say if value is larger than maximum, then I say maximum is equal to value. And now I'm almost all the way there. The only thing I needed to figure out how to do was to set my maximum properly. And there we go. Once you've written the code, it's acceptable to take these comments and remove them, particularly if your code is quite clear. But by scaffolding your code with your algorithm, the TAs and the CAs and me can help you better because we can see what you're trying to do. Uh, so we can see flaws in the algorithm that might lead to an incorrect result. If your algorithm is wrong, even if your implementation of the algorithm is perfect, you're not gonna get the right answer. All right, so let's do one more before we wrap up today. Let's compute the average of a series of numbers. So again, I'll pause for a moment and let you think about how we're gonna do this. Um, in many ways, it's pretty similar to uh, what we just did and to an example that we did earlier. All right, so how do I compute the average? Well, in order to compute the average, I need to know two things. I need to know a sum and a length. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, um, compute the sum divide by the length. And then for computing the sum, I'll say initialize a variable to store the sum, examine every element in the array, add it to the sum, and set it to zero. My sum starts at zero. Okay, so I'm gonna say I need a float Actually, let's, let's turn this into an array of doubles. This is easier to work with. Say double sum, and it's equal to zero. And then I go through the array, and I can use the enhanced for loop syntax here as well. Value, so I take every value out of two average. I add it to my sum. Okay, so that's what I just did. Put this in here for fun. And now the only thing I need to do is divide by the length. And you might wonder, well, I don't know how to do that. I have no indice here, but remember Java arrays have this nice length property. So I'm gonna say sum is equal to sum divided by two average dot length. I'm gonna print that out. And actually, you know what? Let's use a better variable name here. This will help me remember what I'm doing. Or I could do this. I like this better. I'm going to create a sum and then I'm going to say double average is equal to sum divided by average dot length and I think this is correct. Now again let's test it with a couple of values that I think I should know right so the average of zero should be zero 
the average of a bunch of ones should be one. And then let's do, you know, one, two, three, that adds to six, divide by three is two, that should be two. Okay, so it looks like this is correct. All right, so I, I will stop here for today since we've done about the, the normal amount of, of lecture material and we will pick up here on Monday since this is a slightly more advanced example, but something to think about over the weekend. And again, we'll pick up this on Monday. If I wanna go through an array of characters and look at all cases where the two elements next to each other are the same, how would I approach this problem? All right, I have a couple of announcements, so just let me zoom out and get to those. Um, so announcement, all homework problems for the first two weeks are due today at midnight. So if you're behind on the homework, it is time to catch up now. Um, starting next week, every homework problem will be due the day that it's assigned. Um, so you really do need to get into the rhythm of doing these when they're assigned because next week there's no grace period. First couple of weeks, there's still people adding and dropping the course. Starting next week, homework is due the day, the day that it's assigned. MP0 is due on Monday. So we had a great time in office hours last night. A lot of people were making good progress, getting help. Um, please come around today if you need it. Office hours start at 10. They will run until 5 p.m. And, you know, this is the time to get help. Um, we will have office hours this weekend. We will have office hours on Monday. But, you know, particularly if you're a beginner, particularly if you're having a hard time getting your environment set up, come in now. We are there to help. Um, we, like I said, I we had a great setup last night. There were a bunch of CAs around. A lot of people were, were making great progress and, and getting the NP done and coming up with solutions, working on LCM and other parts of it. Um, come in today for help. The earlier you come in, the more we can help you. We want you to succeed in this class. We don't want you to give up. The only way you can fail to learn this stuff is to give up. So don't do that. Come in for help. We will get you through whatever kind of struggles you're going through. I am looking forward to seeing you guys on Monday. I hope some of you saw Barack Obama today and enjoyed that. Have a great weekend, and I will talk to you on Monday.